Hey, Connexus Church, Mark Clark here for the final sermon in this Verses series. And this is one of the biggest ones. This is the one that hones in on Jesus. What people say is the greatest conspiracy theory of all time. Now, conspiracy theories are so hot right now, right? Everything's a conspiracy theory from diseases to governmental ideas. Everyone's got ideas. And there's been a bunch of popular conspiracies all through history. JFK, did he get shot by a bunch of different people? Was it the CIA that killed him? Was it this? Was it that? Uh, the moon landing. There's people who think we never have landed on the moon to this day, that it was a conspiracy brought about by the government that Stanley Kubrick shot. You can watch documentaries on this. People think the earth is still flat. There's flat earthers. And if that's you, I love you. But these are all conspiracy are ideas of taking all kinds of information that seemingly is disconnected, putting them all together and saying there's an alternative explanation for everything. And the biggest conspiracy theory that people say happened is that of Jesus Christ. Now, what do I mean by that? Because some of you are like, I've never even heard of the Christ myth before. Christ myth is actually super popular popular idea. If I walk down the streets of Vancouver today, I bump into people who have literally booths up telling me, handing me brochures that Jesus Christ never existed and that he, all he is, is basically a, a kind of, um, a fulfillment, a Christian fulfillment of a bunch of religious ideas that predated him that he fills out later. And the early Christians just made him up uh, based on earlier mythologies. Uh, Tom Harper wrote a book in 2004. This says national bestseller. This was the best-selling book in Canada in 2004. It's called The Pagan Christ. And it's all about the fact that Jesus wasn't really a historical person. Here's a quote from him. He says, the gospels do not contain the history of an actual man, but the myth of the God-man Jesus clothed in a historical dress. The insanity lies in mistaking myth for human history or divine revelation. Best-selling book in Canada in 2004. My neighbor that I talked to recently uh, was sharing with me, don't you know that Jesus didn't actually exist? Don't you know he was based off of all these different mythological gods and he's not real and the early church invented him? So what do we actually do with this? How do we answer it? Let me give you, let me frame the Christ myth for you and then talk about how we answer it. Uh, uh, here's the basic idea. Horus, Mithras, Dionysus, all of these gods that predated Jesus by thousands of years had all the same things true about them that were true about Jesus. So here's the basic list. Don't you know that Horus and these Mithras and Dionysus and Attis, uh, these Egyptian and Babylonian gods were born of a virgin on December 25th. Uh, three kings followed a star in the east to their birth attended their birth. They, uh, these uh, leaders, these gods walked on water, fed 5,000 people. They were called the Lamb of God, the King of Kings, the light of the world. They were crucified between two thieves and rose again from the dead on the third day. This is why they say this is the biggest scam perpetrated upon human beings because of course 2 billion people out of 7 billion people called Jesus their Lord today and then of course millions and millions and more throughout history. So if it can be proven that Jesus wasn't a historical figure and just based after all these things, obviously Christianity falls apart and there's no legitimacy to it and we all go home and the ball game's over. So what do we actually do? First thing to say is to understand the historical reality that this is not something revolutionary nor is it new. Uh, there's been discussion Discussion about this since the late 18th century, two French philosophers made this idea popular and people just started, it's actually what Freemasons have taught for 200 years. And there's a lot of reasons not to actually believe it. Let's look at a few of them. The first is when you start to scrutinize this theory, even just a little bit, you begin to realize that it's, it's, it's nonsense. So first, the idea that he didn't exist. I was watching a, um, a video of Buzz Aldrin who actually went to the moon with Neil Armstrong. Uh, and a guy walked up to him on the street and said, I don't believe we ever went to the moon. I think you're lying. I think it's a conspiracy. And Buzz Aldrin, he was like 80 years old at the time. You can look this up. He just punches the guy in the face. <laughs> and he just says, stop being so dumb. Of course I went to it. What are you talking about? Um, when it comes to the question of the historicity of the person of Jesus, this is analogous to Buzz Aldrin punching them in the face. Most scholars would look and say, everybody worth their salt believes that Jesus Christ actually existed. There is more evidence for the historical existence of Jesus Christ than most other people of antiquity, of most Caesars that existed of the time, and of any founder of any religion out of all of them. There are far, there's far more historical data saying Jesus Christ existed than any of the rest of them. Uh, so one uh, University of Miami history, uh, a professor of history, Edwin Yamauchi, says this. 
any argument that challenges the claim of a historical Jesus is so ridiculous in the scholarly community, it is relegated only to the world of footnotes. Now, this is true for a lot of reasons. First, because at least 10 writers outside the Bible mention Jesus Christ by name. So these are people who were historians at the time, and some of them were anti-Christian. They were against Christianity, and they actually talk about Jesus in the first century. So you can talk about Tacitus, Pliny the Younger, Josephus. There's 12 of them that we have manuscripts of. I'll give you a couple of examples. So here's Tacitus mentioning Jesus. He says this, Nero fastened the guilt, this was for the burning of, of the city of Rome, on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of Pontius Pilate. Even Bart Ehrman, who's a Christian guy who turned agnostic, he does not a follower of Jesus anymore, he's a historian of the first century, and he believes, of course, Jesus Christ actually existed. Now, Here's the second thing about it. So scholarship says he existed to the point where a lot of historians there, I, I read a, a book on the historical Jesus years ago uh, that was 700 pages long. In the first few pages, the, the very respected Oxford scholar, uh, N.T. Wright says, I'm not even gonna bother spending pages on the question of whether Jesus Christ existed anybody who challenges that is not even listed. It's not even a question, so I'm going to move on with the question because all of the evidence shows that it did. So here's the second question then. Why did the, you got to deal with the rise of the early church. Why did the early church ever rise? They arose not in flourishing greatness. They arose under persecution. They were killed. They were literally chopped in half, thrown into the gladiatorial arenas. They were burned to death, boiled to death. Why would a group of people, and they actually gave themselves over to the sick in Rome when Rome was dealing with people on the plague, and throwing them out in the streets. The Christians are the ones who took them in and care for them. And the Christians were the one who under the threat of death said, no, I'm gonna worship a man who rose from the dead instead of Caesar and died for it. Why would a group of people ever die for a lie that they made up. Nobody does it. You might die for a lie you think is true, but you're not going to die for a lie that you actually got together with a group and said, let's make them, and then they start pulling your fingers apart. Like, listen, my buddy... Here's the thing. My buddy and I accidentally, one day, we had this fun game where we were putting a rope across the bottom of stairs and we would call my buddies. Uh, we said, let's call your brother downstairs and we'll watch him trip. And so we went up like four or five stairs and we took a rope and we put it across the stairs, turned off all the lights. So it's, you know, it's up there. And we called Andrew, Andrew, come downstairs. And his, you know, we heard feet, boom, 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 boom. And we're like, hee, bing crash right into the ground we heard crack and we heard crying problem was the crying was a female's voice and we walked up and it was my buddy's mother laying on the ground full-on bone break wore a cast for the next 12 weeks of her life now we were trying to face the music and we just started lying we're like no we don't know what that rope is we were over here and it took one minute of like, you tell me the truth or you're going to be grounded. It's like, okay, we're lying. Right? Any kind of pressure tends to bring out the truth, especially when you invented it. And yet the early church, all of them die for a lie that they made up doesn't really make any sense. The other thing that doesn't make any sense is if they were making up a lie, you're talking about hundreds of people, thousands of people making up this lie. Here's the one thing. There's a, there's a guy named Jay Warner Wallace, and he's a... Um, ex-homicide detective. And he talks about the one thing you gotta do when you're investigating a murder or any kind of historical evidence is make sure that you, 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 you stay away from conspiracy theories because they're the most unlikely thing to be true. Because A, it's really hard to actually keep them straight data-wise. And then B, unless it's just one or two people, he says the best scenario if you're gonna do a conspiracy theory is just make two people be the ones who are in the know. And when the deed is done and the, and the story's been thought up, kill the other one because at some point somebody's gonna lie someone's going to just let the, it's hard to keep all the data straight it's hard to be like okay i know what i'm doing i know where i'm going and if you look at the early church first corinthians 15 paul's like listen the reason everything the reason the mission's going to go forward is because jesus actually historically rose from the dead and he said, if Jesus really didn't rise from the dead, go read 1 Corinthians 15, we're to be the most pitied of people in the world, which means you shouldn't believe in Christianity if Jesus just rose from the dead in my heart. And it's a metaphor and it's an idea. None of that would actually make the church get up in the morning, give their life for what they're doing. It is very hard to keep a lie going, especially when more than one person knows it. Listen, 
So last year, my buddies and I were going golfing. So there was a foursome, three of us arrived, and it was wet on the ground. And so they said, you know what? You have to stay on the cart paths only uh, with the cart. I was like, I don't want to stay on the cart paths only. And I said, I know a way out of this. So if you're like, uh, uh, if you have a handicap being able to uh, not walk right, you can get a little flag that goes on your cart. And then you, you don't have to stay on the cart path. You can drive out onto the, the fairway, even when it's wet. So I said to the guy at the front desk, and I'm not saying this was my finest moment morally, but I said, you know, my buddy's about to show up and he's a ha he has a handicap, like he has a leg. It's, 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 you know, it's a problem. We need that handicap flag. And the, and the guy's like, oh, okay, cool. So my buddy's not there yet. We're out on the range. And the guy comes out, and unbeknownst to us, we didn't see any of this, we found out after, the guy comes out with the flag, and he starts putting it on the cart. Well, my buddy walks up, doesn't understand the plan, and goes, what are you doing? And the guy's like, what, I'm putting this flag on. He's like, what's that flag for? He's like, uh, for, for the handicap. He's like, what's handicap? He's like, you're handicap. My buddy's like, do I look handicap? Right? And he's like, oh, sorry, sir. He takes the flag off, goes back. He's like, we come back, we're like, where's the flag? He's like, what flag? We're like the handicap flag. He's like, I'm not handicapped. And I'm like, today you are. We need the flag. He's like, what are you talking about? I said, we said you got the flag so we could drive on the fairway. He's like, oh. So then he goes back into the thing. He's like, oh, you meant handicap. Yeah, that's me. That's me. Right? Listen, this is four fumbling fools trying to keep one lie straight. Talk about hundreds and hundreds of people trying to retain the same information under persecution, press, getting cut up to pieces, stretched to death. Not going to happen. Never happened in the history of the world. Doesn't happen with the person in the work of Jesus. It doesn't even make any sense unless he's a historical person. Now, here's another reason the Christ myth loses credibility in the eyes of scholars. Zeitgeist, one of, the, uh, one of the movies that promotes this. There's all kinds of popular versions. There's Tom Harper, there's Bill Maher, his movie Religious. You go watch that, it claims all these kind of things. Um, Zeitgeist, which is one of the most famous internet movies, claims all these kind of things. They just make non-factual statements. So Zeitgeist says this, there are 12 tribes of Israel, and what they try to do is connect all the 12 tribes of Israel in the Bible and the 12 disciples of Jesus and say that that's based on pagan ideas with the 12-month calendar and the zodiac, and, and they're just creating things. The problem with, and so they say this in the movie, there are 12 tribes of Israel, 12 princes, 12 kings, and 12 judges. Well, the reality isn't true. There's 12 tribes of Israel. Yep. And then the 12 disciples are based after the 12 tribes of Israel. That's what Jesus knew. But there's no 12 judges. There's no 12 kings. There's no 12 pr princes aren't even mentioned. Kings and judges, there's way more than that in the Bible. So just factual, myth th their mythology is not even factual in relationship to the Bible. Now, here's a couple other things. They get into Horus. So let, let's start talking about the gods that they say have parallels with Jesus. Horus, Mithras, Addis, we'll talk about a couple of these. So Horus, they say this. Okay, Horus, thousands of years before Jesus, had all these things true about him. He was born of a virgin on December 25th, born in a manger. Three kings followed a star in the east, and he had 12 disciples. He was a fisherman. He was crucified between two thieves and rose again. So let's look at that. First, born of a virgin. Here's the problem. Prior to Horus's conception, his father, Osiris, was fighting another god. He got cut up, and he died. And Horus's mother came over and hovered above his cut up body, certain parts of it. And that's how he was conceived. Now, we can say that that's some kind of parallel to a virgin conception or virgin birth, but that's nothing like what the Bible talks about Jesus. It's how the gods were conceived were all these interesting stories. But to say that's a virgin birth or a virgin conception, just like Jesus is kind of odd. Uh, okay, so second thing, he was born on December 25th. Okay, Maybe he was born on December 25th. The reason that's not a problem is because that's not a parallel. Christianity does not think Jesus was born on December 25th. That was invented in, uh, in 385 AD by the, uh, by the Caesar at the time who was trying to reform one of the worships of one of the other gods. And he said, let's worship Jesus at birth instead on December 25th. People actually think Jesus was born in like April or May, something along those lines. So that's not a parallel. What about the three kings following the star unto the birth of Horus? Well, again, this is not a parallel with Christianity. 
for two reasons. First, and, and that's based on Orion, but if you look at the constellation Orion, you'll see three stars, you know, Orion's belt when you look up in the sky, and then a lead star. And so what they said is there's this, there's this whole cosmic narrative around three kings, and those stars were called the three kings, following a lead star under the birth of a god. Okay, so here's the problem. Two things. First, no one actually talked about those three stars in Orion's belt in, in the typology of a king until the 19th century, literally 1900 years after Jesus. So that's not a parallel because that wasn't even around at the time. But secondly, and more importantly, Christianity does not claim that Jesus was born on December 25th, nor does it claim that three kings arrived at his birth followed by a lead star. All right, I know that tends to be part of our Christmas story, but let me give you some facts about this and totally ruin Christmas for you. First, they weren't kings. They were magi, which were Babylonian magicians. It's right in the word. Or uh, astrologers that would look up in the sky and study the stars and try to, Babylonian or Persian. They weren't kings. They were literally magic or wizards or astrologers. Okay, that's issue number one. Secondly, there was not three of them. I know your kid gets dressed up in his pageant clothes and he kind of goes and he's like, hi, I saw the star in the east and I have come to the birth of Jesus. And he's got the bag bathrobe on. Listen, problem is, and it's him and his two buddies, there wasn't three of them. The Bible never says how many there were. There could have been two because the, the, the word is plural or there could have been 40. The reason we come up with three is because the Bible says they carried gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and us and all our creativity, we're like, well, there must have been three. One guy had the gold, who's got the myrrh, whatever that is, all right? And that's what we tend to think. But that's not what the Bible claims. It could have been 70 of them. We have no idea. The third thing is, the biblical story never says they arrived at the birth of Jesus. Now I've totally ruined Christmas for you, and I'm sorry. The book of Matthew says they arrived at the house, not the inn, that's the Luke story. And when the child was there, the pateon, the, the toddler or the infant, in Matthew's chronology, they probably arrived when Jesus is two or three years old. So I know that totally messes up Christmas because you're picturing giving Jesus gold when he's a baby. He's like, meh, he's actually three. All right, he could grab the gold and be like, what's up, playa? And take off, all right? So ruins Christmas, but it means there's no parallel to the old stories of Horus or any of these things. The other thing is, saying Horus was crucified between two thieves and resurrected from the dead is wrong. He was killed in a fight. And here's the parallel that these writers say is the resurrection from the dead. He's in a fight. He dies, he gets chopped up, he gets thrown in the water. Crocodiles pick up his body and puke it back out onto the, and that's a resurrection. Now, take uh, Mithras, okay? Mithras is a, uh, a Roman god. It says, oh, he was born on... Uh, uh, December 25th, shepherds came to his birth. So when it, now, here's the reality of Mithras. Mithras was born fully formed out of a rock holding a sword and a torch. Now, I'm not saying anything about the sexual activity of rocks, but I'm not sure that that's a virgin birth narrative. All right, I don't know how rocks give birth to other rocks, all right? But that I don't think could be a parallel to virgin birth. It's literally uh, ridiculous to try to say Jesus Christ was, was uh, just people creating him based on these earlier stories. Over and over and over again, you begin to see that it's just not true. Addis, people say, well, Addis would die and resurrected from the dead. Here's the story of Addis' resurrection. His father goes to Zeus after Addis dies and begs that he would raise, Zeus, uh, raise Addis from the dead. Zeus says, I don't, we, we don't resurrect people from the dead because in that culture, that was a bad thing because he wanted to go out to the netherworld. So um, he says, but here's what I'll do. I'll let his hair grow perpetually and his pinky finger will always move. That's their parallel to resurrection. So here's what we got to understand. When you look at the stories themselves, the hieroglyphs, right? Um, Horus didn't have 12 disciples. He had four, a turtle, a bear, a tiger, and an eagle. Didn't have 12. When you start looking at the stories themselves, there's no parallels. And then when you start looking at the Bible themselves, there's no parallels. No. Here's what uh, Craig Evans, who's a scholar, talks about. He talks about something called parallelomania, that you can take ideas and make parallels out of almost anything, which is why most conspiracy theories are actually false, and certainly why the Christ myth is false. Here's what he says. Here, 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 I heard one, uh, one um, uh, person give this analogy, uh, JFK and Abraham Lincoln, that if you were to take isolated information about them and put them beside each other, here's the conspiracy, okay? And these are all, this is all true, what I'm about to tell you. So, 
JFK, Abraham Lincoln. Both men were concerned with civil rights. Both were elect elected to Congress in 46. Abraham Lincoln in 1846, JFK in 1946. Lincoln was elected president in 1860, Kennedy in 1960. Both were slain on a Friday before a major holiday. Both were shot in the presence of their wives and in the presence of another couple. Of the other couple, the man was wounded, but neither wife was. Both were shot from behind in the head. Lincoln was shot in the Ford Theater in Box 7. Kennedy was shot in Car 7 of the Dallas Motorcade. Both were pronounced dead at a location with the initials PH. Peterson House for Abraham Lincoln and Parkland Hospital in Dallas for JFK. The successors of both men were named Johnson. We're not done yet. Andrew Johnson was born in 1808. Lyndon Johnson was born in 1908. Both assassins were privates in the military. John Wilkes Booth, three names, was born in 1839. Lee Harvey Oswald, three names, was born in 1939. Both fled from a theater to a library once they killed the president. Uh, uh, that's what Bo uh, James Wilkes Booth went from the theater to a library where they arrested him. Oswald fled from a library to which, from which he killed JFK, and he was arrested in a theater, in a movie theater. Both assassins were taken into custody by a police officer named Baker. Lincoln was shot in the Ford Theater. Kennedy was shot in a Ford car. The model of the Ford was a Lincoln. That's crazy. Crazy, crazy, but true. And this is the hard thing about these kind of conspiracy. You look at the facts, and I know it's less sexy to slow everything down and look at the facts, but it's very important because you can create all kinds of information by isolated information and try to parallel them and say, look, 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 look. Listen. I was, this week, I went out uh, with two buddies. We were talking to my buddy about something. So we went out to this restaurant. We were chatting for an hour and the server kept coming over. And when we left, my one buddy, okay, so he's bald, has something to do with the story. He looks at me and he goes, listen, do you know the server we just had? I'm like, yeah. He's like, a year ago, I came here with my wife and had dinner and she was treating us really poorly. And I realized after why, because, so here's the thing. So this bald guy's wife, uh, her name is Becky, and she looks like my wife. People mistake them all the time for each other. They have like the fa same face structure or something. So he's out with her and getting all this kind of ba bad vibe. Two days later, because of Becky's connection with other girls, they find out this server went to Village Church and thought my wife was out with a bald man was out with another man and just was feeding the energy. And so the conspiracy started to spread quickly. Mark's wife is cheating on him with a bald man. I can't believe it, which is like, hmm. Right? Now he's muscly, more muscly than me, but I just don't see it. Here's the reality. You isolate information and you can make it say anything. Now, all that to say is this. Jesus is a historical person. The gospels actually are legitimate and they tell us the historical story about Jesus tons of scholars in history and antiquity and G, you know, look at archaeology, look at the New Testament and say, it's legitimacy telling the story of Jesus. Now, there's a couple ways you could take this. What if you did find parallels in these pagan ancient stories that are a thousand years before Jesus? What if you did find parallels that predated Jesus? What would you do? Well, there's two ways. You could either say, and this is what I, how it's going to land for all of us. You can either say, well, you know what? Satan did it. Satan weaved all these stories into all these pagan stories so that when Christianity came along, it would be delegitimized like these people, like Tom Harper and someone tried to say, you know, because they existed before, that means Christianity is made up. Or you can believe what Augustine believed. You know, he wrote this years ago. He said, the very thing which is now called the Christian religion existed before. It was not absent from the beginning of the human race until Christ himself came in the flesh. But it was then that true religion that already existed began to be called Christian. This is the concept of a pre-Christian Christianity. It's almost like God, by his grace, started writing a cruciform power, pattern stitched into history itself 
And that pattern was then one day fulfilled. This is similar to what Paul says. Listen to what Paul says in Colossians 2. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, verse 17, but the substance belongs to Christ. What he's saying is there was a shadow. There was, by God's grace, an anticipation a cross-centered pattern stitched into human history and existence and hearts that Jesus then came and fulfilled. All of this stuff was kind of like a pagan Old Testament in anticipation of Jesus coming to fulfill it, which is the very thing. Listen, C.S. Lewis didn't believe in Christianity because he loved the beauty and the power of story. And he says, if I, if Christianity is true, that means all the myths and what they do to my heart and my life are, 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 are false. And so I don't want to believe him. And he went on a walk on Addison's Walk in Oxford with, with J.R. Tolkien. And Tolkien said, no, 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 you don't understand. You don't have to stop letting the myths do their work on you. Jesus is just the fulfillment of those myths. To the point where Lewis, in his life, came to the point where he realized exactly that. And he wrote these words. He said, the old myth of the dying God comes down from the heaven of legend and imagination to the earth of history. It happens at a particular date in a particular place from Osiris dying, nobody knows when or where, to a historical person crucified. It's all in order under Pontius Pilate, it says. Christ is more than Osiris though, Lewis says, not less. We must not be ashamed of the parallels. They ought to be there. It would be a stumbling block if they weren't. Those who do not know that this great myth became fact when the virgin conceived are indeed to be pitied. That's the idea. Listen, it's like humankind told ourselves this story until it became true. So here's what I have for you then. Here's Paul saying all these things were a shadow of things to come. God has been preparing you to come to know Jesus in your life. And maybe some of you already do, but maybe some of you don't. He has had things in your life that have been leading you along to lead you to recognize that now all these wants and desires and myths and stories have become true in the personal work of Jesus. And now the question is, will you be scandalized enough, confronted enough, encouraged enough to actually believe in him? My, uh, I'm a Christian in front of you today. Uh, became a Christian when I was 19. Walked to a church for the first time when I was 19, 20. And um, it all happened because in the mid 50s, my grandfather was driving down the 401. And you guys know that at Connexus Church in Toronto. And his tire blew. And on the side of the road, he sat there and he looked across the way and there was an old garage shack um, and so he, he walked across the 401, which in that day wasn't that busy. And he went into this garage and he says, is there anyone here who can help me? And this guy walked up to him and said, yeah, uh, what's your name? And they met each other. And he said, I would like to help you. And he said, okay. And he, they went and got the pickup, the, the, the truck. They brought it into the shop and this guy named Ross said, why don't you come back tonight and uh, we'll see how this goes. And he said, okay. And he came back later in the day and he had fixed up his car and they began a friendship. They said, you want to go for coffee? Sure. And so they go for coffee and they strike up this friendship. And Ross didn't tell my grandfather that he was a Christian, but he invited him to come listen to a preacher down at Maple Leaf Gardens. And it was this little known preacher named Billy Graham. And so my grandfather said, sure, I don't know who that is, whatever. And they showed up with my nanny my grandma and they went down and the lineup was so long around uh, Maple Leaf Gardens that they actually couldn't get in. And so Billy said, let's do, another, let's do another preaching thing tomorrow. And so my grandfather came back and he walked forward and he gave his life to Jesus. And Ross and my grandfather became friends for the rest of their life. And my grandfather would pray for me and pray for me and pray for me. And it skipped a generation. My parents didn't believe in Jesus and they were against it, whatever my father was. And here's the thing. I'm sitting here as a Christian and a pastor because of the prayers of my grandfather. And the only reason those prayers existed, the only reason you're listening to me right now is because a tire blew on the 401 in the 50s out of nowhere. This is what God does. This is how he works in his grace. He goes ahead of us before we even, the old theologians used to call him the hound of heaven. He hunts you down 
when you're not even looking for him. That's how good he is. And my prayer is that you would find him in the person and the work of Jesus. Lord, I pray. We pray because this is historically true, not because this is a, a fantasy story that gives us, you know, comfort in the midst of difficulty. We know the high calling on discipleship if you really existed and you really died on a cross and rose again to give us new life. And we want to give our lives to that and recognize that there are sacrifices in that. We thank you that you came and fulfilled these stories in the person and the work of Jesus and that you can give us new life. And I pray for every heart listening, watching this right now, that they would actually give their life to this one who historically, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. You were not only real, but the transformation that you offer right now is real. The eternal life that you offer right now is real. We just have to believe. So burn away that doubt and let us believe and flourish under your glory. In Jesus' great name we pray, amen.